Now this is the uh, Rockingham gate to my home. It's west of the house. Uh, we actually used it as an exit. And it was on this street, Rockingham, that Allen Park drove uh, up that night of the 12th. And uh, Allen Park was pretty consistent in his testimony, and as well as uh, what he told the police in the first interview that he did uh, throughout the trial. And Marsha Clark was almost as consistent with her misrepresentation of this uh, person's um, um, uh, testimony. And it seems strange to me that the that the press or many of the pundits around the country chose to go with Marsha's misrepresentations instead of uh, Alan Park's actual testimony. One thing Alan said was when he drove up this street he didn't notice any cars on Rockingham and he did not notice a Bronco. He didn't notice it when he drove up. He didn't notice it at one point when he drove down the middle of the street Curiously, not along the curb when he wanted to look through this gate to see if he can see anyone in my house. I submit that uh, he rode, came back in the middle of the street because the Bronco would have blocked him riding along the curb. But he also, more importantly, stated that he didn't notice this Bronco when he drove out of the Rockingham gate at a time when I think everybody agreed that the Bronco was there. I find very interesting that uh, if this Bronco was parked askew, as the police uh, time and time again stated. Now you look at this parking job. I mean, you would, you, you'd have to be, I mean, with the parking police to say that this is a bad parking job. This is a truck, and I submit it'd be pretty difficult to drive up and uh, park a car much better than this parking job. A Couple of other points about this Bronco is that uh, uh, a lot of talk about the mixed blood stains that were, were on the console. You realize there was only seven tenths of one drop of blood on that console. I can literally sneeze in my hand, rub it around that console, and you would probably have more DNA. Another uh, incident that uh, came about because of the Bronco, and I found it very uh, indicative of everything that happened in this case and how members of the media and pundits around this country were so quick to jump on any negative, anything that may have made me look uh, more guilty. Uh, was this body bag, this plastic bag, and this shovel that they found uh, in the back of my Bronco. Now, they investigated this case for seven months, seven or eight months uh, before we got to trial. They said it was an exhaustive investigation. Yet, that Friday, they showed the jury, they sprang in front of the jury and the nation, this plastic bag, which they tried to imply uh, could have been used as a body bag, and this shovel that was in the back of my car. And of course, the media that weekend just went wild with it, and I would assume most of the people around the country who thought I was guilty say, see, what did I tell you? Well, over the weekend, they discovered that this plastic bag uh, came with every Bronco. It was standard equipment. It came, uh, it had something to do with the spare tire, and of course the shovel was not a shovel that you would use to dig holes. It was a mucking shovel that you would use to uh, pick up stuff. In my case, uh, we call it a pooper scooper, and I actually had it in the back of my car because I was going over to Nicole's house. She was having some trouble with the neighbor to the north of her because the dogs were, you know, doing their do around there, and uh, this disgruntled ex-husband was going over there picking up uh, the dog do for her. Uh, let's go back in and some other interesting things that I can point out to you out here. Uh, some of it has to do with this driveway. Uh, before I show you some blood drops that were found uh, on the property, let's talk a little about uh, some of the evidence and things that came out in court. One, that you cannot age blood drops. You can't really tell when they were deposited. For instance, uh, two blood drops were found here side by side, and you really couldn't tell um, when, if they were deposited at the same time or not. Uh, one thing is curious to me that these were side by side, which would indicate someone was bleeding from two sides of their body, I guess. Uh, as we go down the driveway, we have cards where they found various blood drops. <laughs> Here's one here, and then there's other cards going towards uh, the front of the house. One thing that really jumps out at you is that none of these blood drops go in this direction to the side of the garage where Mark Furman allegedly found uh, the bloody glove. Some other points I should make about the blood. All the blood, the blood drops going along the side of Nicole's house towards her alley, uh, the blood drops that are on this uh, driveway um, going in various directions uh, to or from my front door, um, the blood splattered Bronco my blood splattered home. All of this blood constitutes less than 15 drops of blood. Less than 
15 drops. Now, when you talk about the uh, estimated one and a half cc's of blood that was missing from the blood vial, that would constitute something like 30 drops of blood. And when you talk about that blood vial, Philip Van Adder, an experienced investigator, for the first time in his career, decided to bring the blood vial from downtown where he could have booked it out here to my home when he didn't even know if uh, Dennis Wong would still be here. I find that very unusual. Since we're out here, let's talk about some observations that Alan Park may have had. Uh, this is my car. It's a uh, Bentley. Uh, and I'm talking about Alan Park here. Alan Park, I felt, was an honest witness who just made some uh, honest observational mistakes. As we know, uh, his comments about the uh, Bronco on the street, he didn't notice it coming or going. He stated uh, that he felt that there were two cars parked here. Well, he was wrong. There was only one car parked here. Arnell, my daughter, didn't return home to about 1 o'clock that night, and I can only assume that his mistake came about because he saw pictures of, uh, that the prosecution took uh, when he was up in their office. I think Cato Kalin would tell you there were only one car parked here. I would go on to say that he was driving a stretch limo. Now, normally, if there were two cars parked here correctly, you cannot get a stretch limo through my driveway. It's just a little too tight uh, back there by the garage, and most uh, limo drivers that come here, if they're driving a stretch, they have to back in on Ashford and then drive out of Ashford. This is a picture that the prosecution took of my car and my daughter's car as they were parked that morning. Now, you couldn't even get a normal car around that curve uh, the way these two cars were parked. Another point I want to make about Alan Parker, once again, I think was an honest witness. I just think he made a couple of honest observational mistakes. He was pretty vehement on the stand that the golf bag that we showed him in court was not the golf bag that I had. He did state that it was a Swiss Army knife golf bag, but this is not the bag, I think was his uh, exact words, and he was pretty vehement about that. Well, Swiss Army Knife only had a few golf bags. They had just recently sent me that golf bag uh, as a gift. It's the only golf bag that Swiss Army makes. There's no other. There could have been no other. So here's a guy who felt that he observed some things. Uh, he was wrong. He had no ax to grind one way or the other. I just feel it was an honest mistake. He was not a detective. He was here just to pick up a customer and take him to the airport. And there's no reason for him to you know, be tested uh, on his observational skills, and unfortunately, uh, he made a few mistakes. Now, since we're outside, let's go back to what I thought was uh, some of the more informative uh, uh, evidence that something funny went on. Walk down the uh, alleyway, or I guess sidewalk to the south of my house, where Furman supposedly found the glove. First thing I want to draw your attention to is there's a door here that goes into my garage and then uh, goes in, you can go into my house that way. Obviously, if I had committed these murders and I was trying to get into my house undetected with a limo driver uh, with an un unobstructed view looking down my driveway, I could have gone through this door. The prosecution made a big deal about this door, saying there was a lot of stuff on the other side so that you couldn't get in this door. But as you can see, it opens outward, not inward. So it would have been no problem to go in there and negotiate some of the items that were on the other side uh, if I wanted to get into my house that night. Now, as we walk down this walkway, you'll see there's a lot of debris, and uh, I have old pavers here, some old bricks here. Um, one thing that's very interesting, there was no blood drops detected anywhere along this walkway. Here, let's take time and look at another door. This door goes into my washroom. Uh, uh, which is obviously inside my house. If you recall, Darden was making a big deal about uh, some clothes that was in my washer, trying to imply they may have been mine. And in closer inspection, we saw that there were panties and things. They were my daughter's Arnell's clothes. And, of course, that's another one of these uh, uh, theories or, or what they call Kodak moments in, in the trial that didn't go for the prosecution, that they thought uh, with all that investigation they had figured something out. One thing you're going to see with all this dense foliage, a little thinner now than it was back then that runs along the side of uh, this house. There's a lot of berries. These berries from these Eugenia plants, uh, they were all over the floor of this uh, walkway. Once again, there was no blood going down here. You see the thickness of the uh, foliage here. It would have been pretty difficult to come over this, this, this wall, this fence. If you take a good look at this fence also, you'll see that it's sort of tied off at the top. Uh, and it's pretty sharp here at the top, and you would think that anyone who was trying to come over this uh, fence could have had some problems with uh, 
hurting themselves on this wire. And of course, there was no uh, blood. You would imagine this person was covered in blood. There'd be some blood or some fibers or something there. Here we have this air conditioning unit, which we've heard a lot about. Uh, once again, when I was talking about that A&E two-hour special that I saw the other night on the trial, and Bill Curtis made a point there saying this was a unit that Cato Kalin heard three loud thumps from. Well, Cato Kalin at no time and this trial said that he heard three loud thumps from the air conditioning unit. Once again, that was one of Marsha Clark's theories. Uh, she said that. What Cato actually said, and he demonstrated when he was on the stand with the, with the table in front of him, that he heard three loud bumps, sort of like that. Now, I don't know what that could have been. Maybe it was a signal. I have no idea. But he never said that he heard anyone hit this air conditioning unit. That was a theory of Marsha Clark's. Now, let's take a good look at this air conditioning unit. You can see there's some slats here. They face outward. It's head high. So one would think if anyone ran back here in the dark and ran into this uh, unit that they should, should have sustained some type of bruise, some type of injury. And of course, if they were bloodied and had blood on them, uh, there should have been some fabric or some blood on that unit. Right down here, about four or five feet from this unit is where they found or where they claim to have found uh, the glove. Uh, one very interesting thing about that glove, there was no debris on it, there was a lot more here then than there is now, and one key thing about that glove, when Furman saw it, he said it was still wet, it was thick, we did some experiments with that with experts, and they all told you that there was no possible way, seven hours later after this crime, that that glove could still have, bloody, uh, have blood on it, could still be wet and still be bloody. That was, I think, a spare, uh, an experiment that I can't recall now if we really got it into evidence or not, but uh, we know, and the public should know, that that was an experiment that was done, and it proved that that glove should have been dried uh, by that time in the morning. Now, let's go around front again, and I'll show you some more interesting things. One other point I should say, once again, these berries that were here were also at Nicole's house. If someone walked out of that or walked way to the side of her house, and if they went uh, into that Bronco, there should have been some debris, some leaves, some berries. The same should uh, have been detected in my home. I have some very light carpeting, which I'm going to show you in a minute. Uh, if someone ran through here and then went right into my house and went up that carpeting, stepping on these berries, one would think there'd be some trace of that on this very light carpeting. Let's go around front. Mm -hmm. Before we go into my uh, foyer and talk about more of the uh, so-called blood evidence, uh, uh, since we're out here, let me cover a few things that sort of came into the, the trial that there was a little car sarcasm about me hitting golf balls. Uh, uh, shortly after I got home, I would say uh, 10 o'clock, a little after 10 o'clock, I came out here. I was actually looking for a sand wedge. I had recently got some new clubs. Uh, Callaway Big Bertha irons, and I didn't like their sand wedge, and I wanted to go back to my old Callaway sand wedge. I also wanted to change my three wood. I'd gone into my garage, and I'd gotten an old three wood, a Wood Brothers, a sort of a custom-made club, even though the head was kind of beat up. I walked out here to my Bentley. I opened the trunk up where I had a lot of golf clubs, which the police had confiscated at some later time, and I couldn't find my sand wedge, and I took a pitching iron. I was uh, looking for some balls. I play with a ball called Maxfly 100. I had no new Maxfly balls, even though I have a closet full of other balls that I'd never used. But I did have a couple of bags of balls in the trunk of my car, balls that I had already used. Normally, I play two sleeves of balls per round of golf. So some of the balls that I would throw away, uh, other people uh, would think were great golf balls. I went through that bag and uh, tried to pick some unscuffed balls. I picked about five or six unscuffed balls. I put them in a little bag that I had in the trunk of my car that had a, a windbreaker in it, a Hertz windbreaker in it. I put those balls in that bag. I took the uh, pitching wig and I took about four or five other balls and I walked over here. I dropped the bag right around here, a bag incidentally we brought into the courtroom, but since Alan Park claimed he never saw that uh, bag and couldn't identify it, uh, Judge Ito wouldn't allow us to put it into evidence. But anyway, I brought four or five balls, scuff balls, drop them here. Normally I have a net here that my son uh, Justin will hit balls into, and I do a lot of chipping around here. And I began to chip those five or six balls away. Uh, I chipped a couple of them over into the sand. I actually chipped, uh, hit a full hit and hit one over this tree onto Mrs. Neverker's property, which is across Ashford. Uh, curiously enough, 
the police found some golf balls the next uh, day. You never saw that in evidence, though, but I saw it in one of their discovery property reports. They found some of those golf balls. I actually sculled one, hit some of the playground equipment, and I had recently gotten all the dents out of my car. I was cringing trying to figure out where that ball uh, had gone. At that point, I walked back to my uh, Bentley. I put the club back in my Bentley. I actually left both the white bag as well as the other bag down here. No one ever mentions that white bag. We'll get to that a little uh, later. And I then walked out and looked into my back of my uh, uh, Bronco to see if I had any clubs there. And my dog was out. We ended up walking back into my uh, Ashford gate because I normally keep one of the gates uh, on a hinge. And then I went into the house. Now, hitting golf balls took all of two minutes, all of about two minutes at the most. And I may have been outside. Uh, between trying to find the club in the trunk of my car, being in my uh, garage, picking balls that were unscuffed, uh, coming over here, hitting golf balls, looking into my Bronco and walking back into my house, no more than 10 minutes that whole period of time. As I walk down my driveway, as you can see, it's easy to see me. Alan Park testified on the stand that he had a, a view from the end of my garage right up here, actually to the front of my house. And this is, uh, I guess, represents some of the uh, biggest frustration I had not only during the trial, but after the trial when Marshall Clark tried to create some impressions that fortunately the jury didn't buy it. Unfortunately, the pundits bought it. They sold it to you. And a lot of people out there, I see in interviews that we do on Man on the Street, they ask this question. You notice that Ross Becker asked me, who was the shadowy figure that came across the driveway? Bill Curtis who did a very fine two hours on A&E, even felt, uh, I asked a question at one point about a shadowy figure coming down the driveway or across the lawn and entered the house. One guy even said, who was the guy Alan Park saw climb the wall? The facts are, nobody, at no time I should say, did Alan Park uh, indicate that he saw anybody climb the wall, come down a driveway, cross the lawn, or even come across uh, the uh, driveway. That was a figment of Marsha Clark's uh, in her mind and she tried to sell that to you and unfortunately a lot of you people uh, bought that. What Alan Park testified to that there was a person that was right about here. He put an X on an exhibit to prove it. Right here was where my golf bags were placed where I walked out of my house, put my suit bag down, looked into my golf bag. When he was let into my property by Cato Kalin and they arrived here, right here was a suit bag which Alan Park thought was a duffel bag as we know now, it was a suit bag. Uh, later on, you saw me on the plane and got off the plane with it. And my golf bag. That's all he saw. In the, in the time he arrived here was 10.20. I guess he was here until after 11 o'clock. That is the only activity outside of my house that he witnessed. Now let's go inside. Well, as I enter the foyer of my house, we're going to go back and talk about blood drops. Uh, I think it should be noted that at no time did they count the swatches that they used to collect these blood drops at Bundy uh, in the driveway here or anywhere in this case. Uh, and the next day when they processed these blood drops or these swatches, uh, they did it in the same area that they had my uh, reference vial. And I'm told by DNA experts that that is a no-no. Now, if you come down here, I'm going to place this picture down at this spot here. This picture shows three blood drops that uh, they said that they found in my foyer right about this spot. Uh, as you can see by my thumbnail, uh, which is bigger than these pegs, that these are pretty small uh, drops. And I believe it was Michael Badnett that uh, testified that that would be indicative of a small paper cut, certainly not of a big cut. Uh, I think we should also point out that it was in this area that Detective uh, Van Adder claimed that he turned over my reference bottle to Dennis Fung. Now, uh, I guess it was in a garbage bag or something, and they gave that to Andrea Mazzola, who took it out, even though they never told her that a reference bottle was in that bag. Uh, when Andrea Mazzola was asked, did you see this exchange take place, uh, she testified that for that one minute, we call it the Mazzola minute, she went into the other room, sat on the couch, and closed her eyes. Huh? sort of a variation on see no evil and hear no evil. Uh, incidentally, they checked all of these items, the doorknob, the light switches, as we move over to my staircase, the rug, my banister, checked all of these items for blood, and of course, no blood found. And if you look at this uh, carpeting, it's a little more plush than the carpeting that was in my Bronco. 
Those Bruno Magli shoes had some ridges in them. You would have thought that if there was some blood in there anywhere, that uh, this carpeting would have picked up some of it, and of course it didn't. Now let's go up to Please. my bedroom. Well, as I come up my stairs, white carpeting all the way, banister, they checked everything and no blood. Now come with me into my bedroom. Now this is my bedroom. Incidentally, I believe this is a book that every American should read. This is the room and this is the area basically where the police claim to have found the socks. Even they admit that these socks seem somewhat out of place. What's interestingly, uh, interesting about that is a videographer named uh, Willie Ford, a police officer, was here at 413. He photographed the entire room. He didn't see any socks. No one told him to try to avoid stepping on any socks. And if you look at that video, what I find very curious is the video goes right up to the point where you would see the socks. The video goes off, and about four or five feet beyond that, the video begins again. So just that crucial area where the socks would have been, you don't see. What's key about Willie Ford being here at 413 is Andrea Mazzola and Dennis Fong in their log show that they collected the socks after 430 after 4.30. Where were those socks when uh, Willie Ford was in this room? Another point I'd like to make about this videographer, uh, throughout this trial, we asked for film. Was there any film taken? This is for you pundits and you people out there that say the police won't cover up and they're forthcoming all the time. We asked on TV, in the courtroom, out of the courtroom, time and time again, where were there any film? Were there any videographer here? Uh, was there any film taken? And they denied it. They denied it. They denied it. Uh, Willie Ford is an Afro-American or African-American, a big man with a video camera. I, 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 I find it hard to believe that you can miss this guy. Now, months and months later, we're looking at some still pictures. And lo and behold, what do we see in one of these still pictures? A picture of a videographer, Willie Ford, in this house taking pictures. Now, I submit to you, there are police all over this house, all over the place. There are police officers who directed this man on what pictures to take, what pictures not to take. We're on national TV time and again. We made requests for, was there any video taken? Were there any film taken at these scenes? And the police denied it. They denied it. They denied it, even though obviously many of them knew there was some video taken. Uh, their excuse was a police officer said he threw it in his draw and he forgot about it. He forgot about it. <sighs> One other point before I leave my bedroom. Now this is my bedroom. As you notice, it faces east. It faces my uh, swimming pool and my tennis court, and the entry to my house is to the west. Now perceptions in this case has uh, really had an interesting effect on the public and on the pundits. Uh, uh, I think it was Alan Park that mentioned that uh, when he drove up, he couldn't see any lights on in my house. And of course, uh, Marsha Clark took that, as she does often, and uh, before the trial was over, uh, it was uh, a definitive, there was no lights on in his house. Tom Brokaw found that very interested, interesting, rather, because he stated uh, after our aborted interview, my aborted interview with uh, NBC, that that was a question he wanted to ask me. Why were you uh, getting dressed in the dark? There was no lights on uh, in the house, and I want to show you something to, uh, to answer that.